May the 8th, 1 Samuel 2.22 through 4.22. Eli was now very old, but he was aware of what was going on around him. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance to the tabernacle. Eli told his sons, I have been hearing terrible reports from the Lord's people about what you are doing. It is an awful thing to make the Lord's people sin. Ordinary sin receives heavy punishment. But how much more this sin of yours, which has been committed against the Lord? But they wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to kill them. Little Samuel was growing in two ways. He was getting taller, and he was becoming everyone's favorite, and he was a favorite of the Lord's too. One day a prophet came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. Didn't I demonstrate my power when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt? Didn't I choose your ancestor Levi from among all his brothers to be my priest, and to sacrifice upon my altar, and to burn incense, and to wear a priestly robe as he served me? And didn't I assign the sacrificial offerings to you priests? Then why are you so greedy for all the other offerings which are brought to me? Why have you honored your sons more than me? For you and they have become fat from the best of the offerings of my people. Therefore, I, the Lord God of Israel, declare that although I promised that your branch of the tribe of Levi could always be my priests, it is ridiculous to think that what you are doing can continue. I will honor only those who honor me, and I will despise those who despise me. I will put an end to your family, so that it will no longer serve as priests. Every member will die before his time. None shall live to be old. You will envy the prosperity I will give my people. But you and your family will be in distress and need. Not one of them will live out his days. Those who are left alive will live in sadness and grief. And their children shall die by the sword. And to prove that what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do whatever I tell him to do. I will bless his descendants, and his family shall be priests to my kings forever. Then all of your descendants shall bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give me a job among the priests so that I will have enough to eat. Meanwhile, little Samuel was helping the Lord by assisting Eli. Messages from the Lord were very rare in those days, but one night after Eli had gone to bed, he was almost blind with age by now, and Samuel was sleeping in the temple near the ark. The Lord called out, Samuel, Samuel. Yes? What is it? He jumped up and ran to Eli. Here I am. What do you want? I didn't call you. Go on back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called again, Samuel. And again, Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. Yes? What do you need? No, I didn't call you, my son. Go on back to bed. Samuel had never had a message from Jehovah before. So now the Lord called the third time, and once more Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. Yes? What do you need? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who had spoken to the child. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again. And if he calls again, say, Yes, Lord, I'm listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Yes, I'm listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am going to do a shocking thing in Israel. I am going to do all of the dreadful things I warned Eli about. I have continually threatened him and his entire family with punishment because his sons are blaspheming God and he doesn't stop them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and of his sons shall never be forgiven by sacrifices and offerings. Samuel stayed in bed until morning, then opened the doors of the temple as usual, for he was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. But Eli called him. My son, what did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything, and may God punish you if you hide anything from me. So Samuel told him what the Lord had said. It is the Lord's will. Let him do what he thinks best. As Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and people listened carefully to his advice. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was going to be a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord began to give messages to him there at the tabernacle in Shiloh, and he passed them on to the people of Israel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. 
the Israeli army was camped near Ebenezer, the Philistines at Aphek. And the Philistines defeated Israel, killing 4,000 of them. After the battle was over, the army of Israel returned to their camp, and their leaders discussed why the Lord had let them be defeated. Let's bring the ark here from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, the Lord will be among us, and he will surely save us from our enemies. So they sent for the ark of the Lord of heaven, who is enthroned above the angels. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, accompanied it into the battle. When the Israelis saw the ark coming, their shout of joy was so loud that it almost made the ground shake. The Philistines asked, What's going on? What's all the shouting about over in the camp of the Hebrews? When they were told it was because the ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. God has come into their camp. Woe upon us, for we have never had to face anything like this before. Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as you never have before, O Philistines, or we will become their slaves just as they have been ours. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. Thirty thousand men of Israel died that day, and the remainder fled to their tents. And the Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas were killed. A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battle and arrived at Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the Ark of God. As the messenger from the battlefront arrived and told what had happened, a great cry arose throughout the city. What is all the noise about? Eli asked, and the messenger rushed over to Eli and told him what had happened. Eli was ninety-eight years old and was blind. I... I have just come from the battle. I was there today, and Israel has been defeated, and thousands of the Israeli troops are dead on the battlefield. Hophni and Phinehas were killed too, and, and the ark has been captured. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to the ark, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate, and his neck was broken by the fall, and he died, for he was old and fat. He had judged Israel for forty years. When Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, who was pregnant, heard that the ark had been captured and that her husband and father-in-law were dead, her labor pains suddenly began. Just before she died, the women who were attending her told her that everything was all right and that the baby was a boy. But she did not reply or respond in any way. Then she murmured, Name the child Ichabod, for Israel's glory is gone. Ichabod means there is no glory. She named him this because the ark of God had been captured and because her husband and her father-in-law were dead. John 5, 24 through 47. I say emphatically that anyone who listens to my message and believes in God who sent me has eternal life and will never be damned for his sins, but has already passed out of death into life. And I solemnly declare that the time is coming. In fact, it is here when the dead shall hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen shall live. The Father has life in himself, and has granted his Son to have life in himself, and to judge the sins of all mankind, because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves shall hear the voice of God's Son, and shall rise again, those who have done good to eternal life, and those who have continued in evil to judgment. But I pass no judgment without consulting the Father. I judge as I am told. And my judgment is absolutely fair and just, for it is according to the will of God who sent me, and is not merely my own. When I make claims about myself, they aren't believed. But someone else, yes, John the Baptist, is making these claims for me too. You have gone out to listen to his preaching, and I can assure you that all he says about me is true. But the truest witness I have is not from a man, though I have reminded you about John's witness so that you will believe in me and be saved. John shone brightly for a while, and you benefited and rejoiced. But I have a greater witness than John. I refer to the miracles I do. These have been assigned me by the Father, and they prove that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself has also testified about me, though not appearing to you personally or speaking to you directly. But you are not listening to him, for you refuse to believe me, the one sent to you with God's message. You search the scriptures, for you believe they give you eternal life and the scriptures point to me. Yet you won't come to me so that I can give you this life eternal. Your approval or disapproval means nothing to me, for as I know so well, you don't have God's love within you. I know because I have come to you representing my Father, and you refuse to welcome me, though you readily enough receive those who aren't sent from him, but represent only themselves. No wonder you can't believe. 
for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the only God. Yet it is not I who will accuse you of this to the Father. Moses will. Moses, on whose laws you set your hopes of heaven. For you have refused to believe Moses. He wrote about me. But you refuse to believe him, so you refuse to believe in me. And since you don't believe what he wrote, no wonder you don't believe me either. Psalm 106, 1 through 12. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. How good you are. Your love for us continues on forever. Who can ever list the glorious miracles of God? Who can ever praise him half enough? Happiness comes to those who are fair to others and are always just and good. Remember me too, O Lord, while you are blessing and saving your people. Let me share in your chosen one's prosperity and rejoice in all their joys and receive the glory you give to them. Both we and our fathers have sinned so much. They weren't impressed by the wonder of your miracles in Egypt and soon forgot your many acts of kindness to them. Instead, they rebelled against you at the Red Sea. Even so, you saved them to defend the honor of your name and demonstrate your power to all the world. You commanded the Red Sea to divide, forming a dry road across its bottom. Yes, as dry as any desert. Thus, you rescued them from their enemies. Then the water returned and covered the road and drowned their foes, not one survived. Then at last his people believed him. Then they finally sang his praise. Proverbs for today, 14, 30 through 31. A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. Jealousy rots it away. Anyone who oppresses the poor is insulting God who made them. To help the poor is to honor God.